Oh, yeah. Good evening. <laughs> or afternoon. Or late yeah. afternoon, right? Where are we? This is evening, I think. It is this evening. will count as evening. Um, well, Mickey, you know, as I mentioned, uh, I had a chance to, to uh, read the book and, of course, uh, you know, look through all of the photographs. I wonder if you could just describe, and we'll have a chance to, to see a bunch of them and to discuss them in, uh, in some detail. Um, but I wonder uh, what it was like for you just going through all the material that went into creating something like this, because it's, you know, it's quite a story and it, um, you know, it documents a period that you know, it was incredibly important for you, incredibly important for your band, right. but also incredibly important culturally and incredibly important for millions of people. And what was it like just going through all that material and putting it together? Well, it, it was uh, mostly a, a thrill. Uh, and it was, it was very, very revealing. And the, the old sort of slightly corny adage that every picture tells a story, because this is very much driven pictorially, and the, there is editorial and, and I hope stuff that, that makes good sense, trying to keep a story of what started the whole thing, and known as Fleetwood Mac. And there were moments uh, where I had a certain amount of, of uh, an archive that had survived to some reasonable extent, not as much as I thought, to be quite blunt. <laughs> uh, hence the lovely book company, Genesis, that put not only this book, but many others that are, as you are well aware of, they're, they're very beautifully done. And they also have uh, uncanny methods of finding, foraging uh, for material, and s some of which, of course, uh, to some reasonably large degree, ended up uh, supplementing what I had. And there were moments that were very personal, and yet this book, although presented by me, is, is very much about uh, paying uh, kudos as an observer, which is a slightly strange thing to be saying, considering I've been in the band since it started. But for that reason, I wanted to try and make sure that it wasn't an I, me, Mick, Mick, Mick thing. Uh, but there were those moments when I did indulge, if, if I might say, a little bit, that were really poignant. One of them, there's a couple of pictures that are just photographs, but they're photographs, and the, I, the IE would be that there were pictures of Peter Green, not, and the book is dedicated to Peter Green, who started the band Fleetwood Mac, and some people don't realize that. I was lucky enough to be at his side as the original member that helped Peter put this all together. And there was a picture or two in there on the last little mini tour we did in Europe. And we knew that he was leaving. And I remember on the tour bus looking at Peter. And there's a picture of him on the bus. And I, I remember distinctly going like, I wonder, I wonder if there's just a chance he'll change his mind and, and not leave and he he did and those moments were 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 pregnant moments in terms of what's in this book uh, many of them for me and and of course historically there is a a section in here which became really a reminder to me and we were talking briefly backstage about the import is is to pay a uh, attention to the story, which is not only the original four members, uh, and very shortly after the, the inception of Fleetwood Mac, Danny Kerwin's, the five of us, is, is a whole slew of, of people came, including, of course, Bob Welch, all of which is in this story. But the band was a, was a band that was formed for the love of playing music, no doubt, but blues music were, were these were our heroes. and. Uh, it, it was a bunch of bunny, funny English guys that just would do anything to listen to music of, of our, our heroes, our, the masters, uh, so many that uh, I could reel off you know, dozens of people. What came to the fore in putting this book together was we found 
some, we were lucky enough to go to Chess uh, Records and do Blues Jam at Chess with uh, Willie Dixon, who put it all together with Mike Vernon, our little record company, Blue Horizon. But being reminded of that and finding, uh, we found way more photographs that I'd never seen of us in the studio. And the reason it's so important for this book, probably almost the most important thing, is we were a blues band. Yes, and absolutely. You were reminding me, you, came, you saw us all those Yeah, I did ago. see that early version with uh, Peter Green and Jeremy Spencer and Danny Kerwin um, out at the Action House on Long Island. I don't know if any of you remember that place. I may be the oldest person here. Um, <laughs> but it was 1970, and uh, I went you know, because of Peter Green, I I'd, I'd, you know, heard about him and heard him uh, with the Blues Breakers and knew that he had this new band together. And it was one of the most extraordinary shows I'd ever seen. Uh, you know, initially, even as a kid, I was thinking like three guitar players, you know. But it, there was a sense each of those players had such a distinctive style. And everybody was just... On, you know, I was I was saying to Mick. I mean, the thing that I remember is nobody was just kind of feeling their way into a solo. I mean, it was like the second they started playing, they were on fire, and it was. I, I felt like I was pinned to the back wall of the club. I was, my brain was blown open. It was quite an extraordinary thing, and I, I saw everybody back then. I was one of those kids who went to every single show, wow. and that one was so distinctive. Um, you know, that, that I never forgot it. I can tell. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a little dubious about what else you actually remember. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, that's, yeah. We'll, uh, hopefully none it's of the hotel a little bit fuzzier. So. Yeah, right. Uh, that's um, amazing. Well, let's start looking at some of the uh, photographs and, uh, and sure. kind of wander through. Uh, now, who would that be? This is where, <laughs> I, this is where I break my neck. No. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, who is that cheeky guy? I, I, I actually don't know where that was taken, but I do remember the drum kit. And it's, uh, as you can tell, it doesn't match. There's all sorts of, probably half of it's stolen or something. <laughs> it's, uh, that is a white, it's probably when I was in a band called The Shanes. Uh, which was uh, before Fleetwood Mac. And it would have been in London, because uh, I, I never had a drum kit that big at home, for sure. <laughs> and wow. And there you were again. I hope there's some shots of some other people. Uh, yeah, we do. <laughs> or the narcissist. Yeah, there you are. There's oh, there the... you go. That's yeah. the Shanes, both shots with different members. And that was the first incarnation. The chap on, on this side is Peter Bardens, uh, Peter Hollis on the floor, the bass man. And they are, are using and abusing my legs, as you can tell. <laughs> and there's Eddie Lynch, who you can tell was a huge fan of Buddy Holly. Uh, and he really was. And, and he sort of looked like him. And that was the first official band. And Peter as is revealed in the book in, in some of the, the, the copy. Peter Bardens literally knocked on my sister's front door in Notting Hill Gate in a place called Horbury Mews. And he'd heard, and he lived in, in the Mews, and it's a cul-de-sac. And he said, I heard you playing drums in the garage, which is understandable, that's what I used to do. And he knocked on the door and he said, well, I'm a manager. And, of course, he wasn't. And he, he, he did have a sort of worn-out mohair suit on. And he said, I represent a band called, the, the, not the Shanes, but the Senders. And he said, would you like, I'd never played with any band in my life, but my whole dream of coming to London, which is explained in the book a little bit here, but Peter started my career. And I still uh, know his his uh, daughter, um, her godfather, and he's no longer with us, but that knock on the door is truly a rather important one. 
So well, I, I'm always very aware of uh, paying homage to, to Peter. What was it that drew you to drums? What took? Well, what drew you to playing drums? Oh, I, I don't know. Uh, I've often thought about that, that there was never any, like mum or dad, uh, one of them was a musician or a part-time musician. Uh, there was the radiogram, and my mother was, the, if anything, was the mu She did play violin when she was very young. I knew nothing about that, so that had nothing to do with it. Dad used to do this thing. He was in the Royal Air Force, which has nothing to do with what I'm talking about, but if there was a little bit of money in his pocket, he would do, you know when you play spoons? Sure. And Dad played spoons a bit, and he would do this sort of military stuff. So that's about it. And then he, at parties, he would play bottles or wine glasses with <laughs> stuff. And I, and I remember in, we were in Germany for some reason, and I, and I crept. We were in some uh, sort of pub, German pub, staying the night. And I was supposed to be in bed. And then I think Dad had had the one or two. And, and he was doing his party piece on all these glasses. But no real reason apart from Early on, whenever my mother would do the cleaning, she would put the BBC home service on because we were often posted overseas. Uh, this particular memory would be from Norway, which is really, I suppose, where it started. And I started hitting furniture. Like when mum would have the radiogram on, do the cleaning. She didn't smoke, but she used to have one little puff on a cigarette when she did the cleaning and have a, a little little glass of port, because neither my parents really, I'd, I had no memory that they were a couple of lushes and drank themselves <laughs> into the ground. But it was sort of a ritual, but the radio would be on. And that's where I first remember doing this. And it sort of didn't stop. Yeah, still hasn't <laughs> stopped. Well, that's a whole uh, section which is, is hugely important, and I got to, uh, it's not only as Peter Green over here, as John with me here, and I think that's up in Kluke's Cleek, uh, a club. Looks like another stolen drum kit. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and John met the most important thing here is to mention uh, this is us working, I'm believing, with John Mayle. And when John, Peter, and myself were in the Blues Breakers, and anyone that's not aware of John Mayles Blues Breakers, it spawned uh, such a, a, a chunk of, of players, and I, I mean that by mainly all the fantastic guitar players, Eric and Mick Taylor, and of course Peter Green, and, and, and really quite a few more. Ainsley Dunbar, an incredible drummer that I took his job for a short it was while. Like, it seemed like I never really understood. What, that's a whole. Oh yeah, <laughs> Ansley's drumming. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, it's like a science. And, but John Mayle yeah. uh, it is uh, really to be looked at as. I did this interview for the book, talking. Spent the afternoon with him. And I, and I said, H "How sort of amazing is that? That he's like a founding father, a mentor to, to the, the British blues." Scene. It seemed like almost Alexis like a kind Corner, of college Cyril for Davis, yeah. John Mayall. These were people that sort of had a, the school. It was like the school of rock, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and and of course, it it is unbelievable how many people came through his band, and he's very active to this day. And we had a lot of fun and, and a, a huge thank you to him. Uh, and he was always a a huge fan of, of Peter Green's to this day and has, uh, was very conversant with all of his memories, and some of which are in, in the book, you know, about that. So that's us in John Mayle. And everyone always thinks that it was a, a, a sort of devious plot, that the three people, players in, in John Mayle, and I was with them for a short while, and got disengaged from my my gigs, I drank me and John like to drink. And John McVie, who's an incredibly talented musician, had been with John Mayle for many, many years. So one of us had to go. Uh, and there was definitely. He had seniority. And it was, yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> it was a, a long standing joke with, with me and, and John Mayle that I got my marching orders uh, to 
to go and uh, take a hike. But uh, it's very often thought that the three of us thought of forming Fleetwood Mac while we were in John Mayle's Blues Breakers. It never was even, in fact, Peter, when he left John Mayle, um, he was wanting to go to Morocco like Brian Jones did, you know, and, and I think Eric went to Morocco, so he thought, well, I'll do what they, it was a thing. Yes. You know? <laughs> I, it was, I'm going to Morocco and, you know, I'm going to smoke the peace pipe for <laughs> six months or something. And I don't think he ever made it there. And Eric came back from wherever, and Peter was at, by that point was, was in, still in John Mayall. This was before I joined. And he lost his gig because Eric came back. So there's a whole mishmash of things that happened, none of which ended up with anything like a conspiracy. Peter, when he finally left, uh, really didn't want to do anything. And uh, it was almost forced into you've got to form a band and uh, you've got to do this, you've got to, but people in the business, you know, and they persuaded him to form what turned out to be a phone call to me uh, to be part of uh, this band. One of the um, really interesting parts of the book is your, your descriptions of, of Peter's personality, uh, you know, the, and the, the complicated relationship that he had with putting himself forward and with fame and any kind of, um, uh, you know, kind of focus on himself beyond, you know, beyond his playing. And I wonder if you could just talk about um, just him as a person and, and maybe him as a musician as well and what it was like when you first met him and what you heard and, and felt about him. I will try and stay on track. and. Feel free to cut me off because I tend to sort of go off at a tangent. But the first part of the conversation and answer would be I have a confession. And the confession is that when Peter turned up to audition for a band that uh, the other chap I told you, Peter Bardens, who gave me my first break, uh, said, Well, this guitar player, I've heard, is pretty good. And he's going to come and sit in and audition. And myself and Dave Ambrose, a, fi a fine bass player, went on to play with Brian Auger and a whole lot of uh, great people. Peter, came, Peter Green came in with his chops down here, duffel coat, looking like uh, a character from that film, The Gangs of New York or something. <laughs> <laughs> like hardcore, you know, just... I, and plugged in and he had a, he had a Les Paul. Um, in our world, we're going like, wow, he's got a Les Paul, you know. And he did. Uh, stolen, I'm sure. No. <laughs> but no. Uh, and I made the app, considering that he's my favorite guitar player, I mean, he, because he comes from my, my, my past and where we all learned stuff. And myself and Dave Ambrose said, I don't think he's got enough ability. He only plays like a few notes. It was like the world's worst mistake that <laughs> I could have ever, when I look back on it, because he's, and Peter Bardens turned around and said, you're both wrong. This guy is, is so special. And he was the first time I heard the expression, less is more. And, and yeah, he it's played like, the right notes, yeah. Yeah, playing the right notes. And, and he very quickly, uh, very quickly, I, I turned like a, a rat uh, around on myself and sort of <laughs> went, but it was a terrible mistake. And one I actually remember and always like mentioning because, because I am such a huge advocate of what I learned from Peter and what Peter has, uh, well, he started this band, Fleetwood Mac. And so he was uh, very generous later on, uh, which is a, a lesson which I think has had some residual results with what I learned from subconsciously, probably, from Peter. If you think of Peter Green was looked at and adulated like Eric Clapton. Eric went in to form what was really one of the first super bands, was The Cream, um, which was like a Led Zeppelin. It was, uh, they, were, it was, they were the deal, and he was the deal. Peter didn't want that, and 
the first thing he did was name the band Fleetwood Mac. And the first album, it says Peter Green's Fleetwood Mac. And he was so angry about that. And they slipped it. I know why, because no one knew who we were, but s some real purpose to the fact that Peter was, was on the circuit, was really well known, and was this up and coming guitar yes. hero, you know, Green is God and Eric's no good and all this stuff. I mean, all this stuff was happening plastered over bus stops and things. Clapton is God, and then it was like, whoosh, green is God, and <laughs> it, was, it was a crazy scene with the blues fans, you know? But he, he gave straight away that, and, and he continued to do that. If you look at the first album, the, al the album uh, with the dog on the front, that album is, is hard. I mean, he's featured on it, but he so gave more than half of that to Jeremy Spencer. The point being, he, he was very, very, very generous and, and was all about being uh, in a band. So much so that I learned many years later in a, in a really bona fide interview, it, it said, well, how, to Peter, how did you, the name, you know, Fleetwood Mac. And he, he just, and I learned this, ages and ages after the fact. He said, well, I always thought that at some point, I probably won't be in the band. I'll, I'll, I will have moved on, which of course he sadly did. And I want John and Mick still to have a band. This That's is amazing. crucial, and there's more, I could go on a litany of stuff. And there's, there's another major moment we might touch on, which just describes him as a person. Then play on the album. Danny Kerwin, a uh, young lad that used to come and sit in the front row and watch Peter. The h half of that album is, is Danny. Boom. And that's what Fleetwood Mac has always been. People who have come through the ranks of Fleetwood Mac have always been accepted for their own worth as players. And, and as you are well aware, some very, very different from the band that we are spending time talking about, which is, is, I have to say, is appropriate how it started. And I hope we, we touch on some of the other elements, uh, especially Bob Welch and how Christine came into the band. But Peter was incredibly generous uh, as a person and as a musician, uh, and you can tell. Well, you established a, a kind of sensibility or a, a generosity, as you say, that really continued and has, you know, has made that band as a kind of institution just stay together and, and remain supple, main, you know, kind of accepting of, of new influences and new forces and has survived and thrived in so many different ways. Well, we can thank Peter and John and myself learning to do that, you know. There's John Mayle, that's probably still up in uh, there were we called them pubs. I mean, there were pubs with with annexed rooms that became clubs, uh, and and that was our circuit primarily. If we ever played like somewhere like this, we would think, "Oh my God, we <laughs> <laughs> this is it's a stage, a proper here. stage, no, yeah, exactly." It, you have to understand that our memory, uh, and I'm getting off track, but, but in terms of, of turning up to places, I'm sure hundreds of dozens of places like that, where I remember the first time that I, I had an official gig, you know, like yes. we were going to play a gig, you know, <laughs> and, and, and <laughs> we were getting paid in cheese sandwiches, <laughs> you know, but it was like, and I got there so early because I had to set up the drum kit anyhow. And I remember going to say, well, where do you set up, you know? <laughs> I was trying to do the right thing. And the guy behind the bar, you know, he's like mopping up, getting ready to open up for the night or something. And he, he did, hardly even looked up. Like, he said, over there, did, you know, over there. Like, <laughs> and and I, I'm looking over there, I'm going like, it's just, the, it's just 
the floor, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I said, you mean it's because I I thought, oh, but this is the big big time. I'm playing, you know, and. It was all about wherever you were told. And he said, no, over there where the carpet is. And it was like some old worn yeah. out carpet with some sellotape or tape that sort of, that's where, the, where you set up. And, and we learned very quickly to make the best of wherever you are um, and dig in and, you know, and perform and, and do, do what you, you should do as a player to get over. But I, I was very soon that put on, on track that you, it wasn't the big time straight away where I had visions of like, oh, there might be a stage. <laughs> <laughs> it's like uh, Sunset Boulevard or something. Yes, you know? exactly. I'm ready for my close up. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that, well, that, there you go. You can, for sure, you know, you know the, the name of the band. John Mayer was a good marketer. <laughs> <laughs> It, no, seriously, he knew his stuff, and I can tell that. And he, he, that's his he had this incredible harmonica harness, and I'm believing that's it on the left, I think. But more importantly, it's, uh, I, that would be in the studio. I'm not quite sure where. Uh, that's probably from John Mayle's archive with young Peter, and you can tell like that that the whole thing of that's pretty much how Peter looked in the early days. He looked a bit slightly more rugged when he walked in, and I thought he was useless. <laughs> but that, that didn't. There you go. And he, he was uh, an, such a. Uh, had, had a vision. And, and when he said, because his whole life, as you know, changed to being completely like, has no, he, he's no regard for what. I know that he did, you know, yes. which is in itself a whole other story. But back in the day, he, he was very focused. And we came from very different worlds. I, I came from a totally different type of education, went to public school, which is privileged, to be quite blunt. And he came from the East End, from a Jewish background, and had, had a, a, quite a miserable childhood, from all accounts. And I knew nothing of the sort. You know, I, had, I was blessed with. So we had this funny meeting place as friends from totally different worlds. And I, I was very uh, always eternally grateful because Peter would, I was never that confident about you know, playing the drums or something. And he, he, he said, enough of all that, you know, you you play f from the heart, and, and, and I'm going like, well, what's that, you know? <laughs> and because he came from f fighting to be who he was in his, and probably overly so, and that's why he, I think, was so attracted to blues music. And it sounds almost a little corny and self-serving, uh, but he identified with, with I, for sure, with uh, an avenue to get some of the pain that he felt as a young chap, and it's it's in there, and and uh, he, he that's a a really major thing, and he was a lot of fun, uh, but you wouldn't want to mess with Peter Green, you know, <laughs> if there were a couple of promoters that pretended that we weren't making the money, and Peter wouldn't he would sort them out. It would sort them out, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's Jeremy Spencer. Uh, I think that for sure is from, that's from Jeremy's archive, uh, probably in, in Litchfield, where he, and he has a, this looks like he's given everyone the finger, but actually that's the slide on his guitar. Uh, he, he was and is, uh, one of the greatest slide players ever, and, and worshipped Elmore James, who, who was a great, great, great slide player, uh, a great guitar player, but, uh, and, and worshipped Elmore James, and basically was Elmore incarnate, where he... Well, when you went to Chicago, that... Yeah. Uh, uh, there's a picture in there with, with J.T. Brown, who was the saxophone player 
in Elmore's band. Elmore had, had passed away uh, quite a few years before we went to, to Chess Records. And that was quite something. But he, he owned, you know when you go to the theater and you, you go, yeah, it was pretty good. And then, then suddenly you go and you go, it doesn't have to be someone who's quote famous, but just you go, you know you've been captivated and you know that they're playing a part but you actually forget that they're playing a part. Yes. That's when you know you've been grabbed literally by the you know what. And, and, and it, it transcends because being a, uh, in a way a, a copyist, uh, but he wasn't. He was, so, he, he was so into Elmore James that you... Became he, Elmore, he became James. Elmore James. He became Elmore James. He he uh, he turned up in London, and he's tiny. He's tiny, tiny, tiny chap, and he always insisted on having these giant guitars. That so, and that that was one of them. But he used to have even bigger guitars than that. He turned up at, at Peter Green's home, which was in Putney, because Peter was still living with his family. And a little, we all we used to have duffel coats and Levi's and stuff. And he had this big old guitar, just one, big old guitar in a case. And he opens it up and got all sorts of wires, sticky tape with pickups and stuff. And then, you know, later on that day, he plugged that sucker in. And he, he was dynamite, total dynamite. There was that great story, uh, which touches on a little bit of that. But when you went to, um, when you went to Chicago to make that album at Chess Records, and then years later when you... Uh, Eric Clapton was touring uh, pretty recently uh, with uh, Andy Fairweather Lowe and oh, his band. Yeah. And, um, you, and, and Clapton came over to you and said, listen, whatever you do, don't mention to Andy your album at Chess That's Records. Right. He makes us listen to it every night before we go on. <laughs> and, uh, that is absolutely true. Uh, and that story is so great because, you know, I went back and listened to it, you know, to prepare and to come and speak to you. And I was just reminded of how deep in you guys got. Like, you know, I think, you know, like when the Rolling Stones went to Chess Records, they kind of, they made a Rolling Stones record, whereas you guys made, you know, like a blues record, like the way those guys made blues records, you yeah. know. And, and with the guys. And with and the guys, that's right. No, we'll, we'll see some pictures in a minute, but. Uh, no, it's a tr that's, a, I'm, that's brilliant. You, you, that actually is absolutely true. No, it said, no, 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 no. Don't start talking about. I have to listen to that album, it, literally. And, and I did find out because, <laughs> needless to say, Andy did talk about it. He said, "No, we we have it on in the dressing room." And Eric comes into the band's dressing room just to, to warm up and say, "Okay, let's go, guys. We're on." And, and he has to walk into Fleetwood Mac <laughs> every night and listen to Peter Green. Uh, that is so funny. That's uh, Jeremy's band that he uh, that he left to join and come to London. Uh, that was his, his band. That's the first gig we ever did at the Windsor Jazz Festival. And Bob Brunning, uh, to mention, there's no John McVie there. That's me and Jeremy, as you can see, this little chap, this giant guitar. And Peter, <laughs> with much deference, as you can tell, back. And, and Peter was a, not only a brilliant, brilliant lead guitar player, but he really, really like to dig in, we were talking about that too earlier, playing rhythm and complimenting Jeremy. And, and mostly, because Jeremy did most of the songs in those days, uh, and Bob Brunning on the right was, was a bass player, fantastic chap, but knew that the band was called Fleetwood Mac, you know, and John McVie was playing the same show that day with John Mayles Blues Breakers, and uh, I sort of tongue-in-cheek do have, my explanation is that John McVie has is, is got Scott's blood in him, and uh, I think for sure he, he wanted to make sure we had plenty of gigs before he actually left John Mayo. <laughs> <laughs> so he'd get but, his pay package. So the irony was at this gig, uh, and, and Sweet Bob uh, did a great job and, and, and hung in there until John McVie phoned up a, really a short while after. But, we just played at City Field, and I, I mentioned that to someone else uh, a couple of days ago, looking at this picture, 
and you're going like, we th this is the big time for us, right? This is not the carpet in the, in the pub, and this is the first, this is the first gig, you know, and we played in, in places before that, in little bands around town, and we thought this was the biggest thing since sliced bread, and, and the PA system, which was a WEM system, was like the godfather of PA systems. And when you think about what it actually is compared to what we were using just three days ago. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and I go I like, wow, how things have changed. But um, it was a great gig, and, and we were blessed that we had Peter Green, because believe me, we wouldn't have been on the big stage if it wasn't for him and his... Uh, wonderful uh, reputation that he had built up with John Mayer's Blues Breakers. But at that gig, John Mayer was playing, I think, I think Eric was playing with Cream, whole load of Oh yeah, if you went through the, um, yeah, the whole I think the, the whole lineup is in the book like, and it's uh, an unbelievable. It's like a little um, index of every important blues know, oriented band at that time. 13th August, 1967. Yeah, almost to the day. And Christine McVie, and I mentioned this because why would we may not come back to one of these pictures from Windsor Jazz Festival, I don't know. But Christine McVie was in a band called Chicken Shack, and she was playing in The Tent, and no. <laughs> where we would have been if it hadn't been for Peter, I'm sure. And unbeknownst, this whole tie-in of this particular day, when you think about it, the movement of what was going on, John was there but wasn't in the band yet. Christine, who he married, was playing in a tent, had never, to my knowledge, met any of us. Andy, uh, the bass player, Andy Sylvester, became one of my dearest, dearest friends and remains so, as with Christine. They're in this tent playing with Chicken Shack. We'd heard about Chicken Shack from up north. And then Chris used to come with Andy to our shows, as many as they could, because they loved the band and loved Peter. And this whole, and then, then eventually she joins Fleetwood Mac. She's already married to John, the bass player. And how wild is that? <laughs> I know. <laughs> Absolutely. It's, it's almost, you, if you wrote it, you go, it's not true. Which is... No, it would seem too contrived. Absolutely. Correct. Yeah. There's Johnny Mac uh, with John Mayle. And I think that, that on drums is actually Keith Hartley. So... That's from John's uh, archive with a nice picture of John McVie. And while I'm on the story, if you look at the bass, which is a Fender Jazz, I think, or Precision, uh, it's quite a hefty instrument. And when I first took over, not from Keith Hartley, but, but from Ainsley Dunbar, and everyone was hero worshipped in, in John Mayle's band. There'd be followers like, go on, you know, Keith, go on. You know, <laughs> no one had heard of me. So when I took over from Ainsley, who was a, was, is an absolute genius drummer, uh, you know, g genius, and I go and I, and they said, well, we want someone to just play simple stuff. So fair enough, Ainsley somewhat, I was befuddled why he was losing his gig. But he had this following, and, and I remember not at this gig, but that particular guitar, or one very like it, I'm sure that, that's the one, is that I got heckled at the first show I did with John Mayo. And like, where's, where's Ainsley? Like, <laughs> come on, where's he? he's useless, you know, or whatever. <laughs> like, he doesn't even do a drum solo. And, which I didn't, I still don't really, but... Um, and John, right there, and I knew John a little bit. We used to play the circuit when I used to go and see these guys. And John, very rarely, if you've ever seen documentaries or films on Fleetwood Mac, I doubt you ever see John, uh, John McVie coming up to the microphone, ever. He plays bass, and that's the way he likes it. Well, this particular time, when I was dying, I'm going like, literally wanted to g dissolve into, into the stage, he comes up with, it's sort of held much like that, but higher. Like, I've got something in my hand, and I'm going to wrap it around your head if you don't <laughs> shut the you-know-what up. And he said, give this guy a chance, you know, and made the speech. 
Everyone went quiet, and I got through the night. And I, I never forget that. That's amazing. That's a true buddy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for sure. Whoops. That's it. We've been hit over the head. Ah. That's more from. Uh, well, there's your big crowd at wow. uh, Windsor. Look at, yeah. look at the big stage there. But it's uh, that's early, early days, just endless photo sessions in London. And I hope Ooh. one day you might put up what was, God, I remember that. I still got that ring, the eyeball. <laughs> <laughs> I got my eye on you. Oh, what's happening here? Oops. These, these I'm thinking, no, they're not the first shots because Danny's already already in the band. And as with Jeremy, when Danny came in, Danny Cohen here, uh, Peter was so, so generous just and took him under his wing and and they played. It was the beginning of, again, what we, we touched on, those three guitar players when you yes. walked into that club that got hit over the head by three of them. Exactly. And that's the the big, the big three there, which was very unusual in a band. You, you often had, you know, maybe a couple of rhythm guitar players, and you have the lead player. They all worked in duality, and they we became three bands in one, really, in many ways. Yes, exactly. That, that many, 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 many years later, and and some of the journey in between, was became almost part of the lineage of the history of Fleetwood Mac. If you look at the fact that Stevie and Christine and Lindsay are, are all stylistically very different, very different. And all of these guys played very, very different approaches to their guitar playing. And Jeremy, very much so. I'm thinking that could be at Chess Records. I'm not sure without looking at some of the stuff. And that would be from Danny's, I, I would say that that's Danny not in Fleetwood Mac in a, in a band called The Boiler House. And I mean, he was literally like 15 years old. Looks 15 you know. years old. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You notice the harmonica. And in those days, and you know, that's how you, when you can't, you put your head right on the, the guitar. These days you have tuners on phones and, and you're told where it is. But we, were, we were huge sticklers for tuning, which is intonation, which is, uh, for anyone out there who's a musician, I don't play, I mess around on guitar, but I, I'm around that, and, uh, which is about being in tune and being in pitch. And with Peter was known uh, as was Danny, all of them, with bringing, bending a note, but keeping it in pitch. There were many, many, in those days, everyone would say, well, I play blues. You go like, not really. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, I've got a Marshall amp and it goes to, you know, 13 or, you know, like Spinal Tap. But <laughs> not really. It's all about touch. And, and you've, the first thing to learn which was hugely important, was uh, to be in tune. And, and it's so often through the, through the years, not by the band that I've been in, gets forgotten. And it also gets forgotten if you bend a note, you have to know when to stop, or you bend it in and then out of tune. Peter would have had a harmonica to, to check, check the note, uh, and then done the rest by, by ear, religiously. And, and we would not play out of tune. And, and I've been with other players where, for whatever reason, we would call, when I say we, the, the original Fleetwood Mac would say, that's not acceptable. That's not OK. And you have to have the discipline to be in tune, which was quite revealing about there was a form of real discipline and dedication to, to starting off with, with, a, with a band that was in tune. And he, he insisted on it. And John McVie, to this day, would say, ah, ah, stop. 
at a sound check. Now, not in tune. Wow. That's me and Pete. That's at chess. Mike Vernon on the left in the striped T-shirt. And those, that was chess records. I think that's Buddy Guy I on the right. I was about to say, is that Buddy Guy? Wow. I think so. And Jeremy in the back. You can see that that's getting, the guitars are getting bigger. <laughs> <coughs> and Oops, sorry. I'm Should we go say, back? I'd want to. No, I, I, yeah. I'm just going to make a comedic comment. I still have my balls. <laughs> uh, this is such a great shot to me. Not of this thing here on the drums, but all of that going on in, in the background. And you have to remember what that meant to this funny bunch of English lads being in the church. Chess records, as you well know, and any, anyone, uh, happily I'm believing it, it's still there and it's, it's been kept as a, a shrine of sorts. Uh, but to be in, in, the, in the studio, but then to be in the studio with, with uh, a lot of, God knows we knew who they were, and Willie, Di Willie Dixon put all this together with Mike Vernon, and it was, it was something else. And I had somewhat forgotten uh, what that, briefly before we get on to that, what that meant. And that's why we were talking earlier about, that really tells the story about a lot of guys and girls, understandably, would not know that that's where we started because the enormity of, of the band that exists in the here and now and for the last 40 years, uh, understandably, it, that's going to be the, the incarnation that, that, correctly so, will be remembered in the proportion that it is going to be remembered in. And, but this is a nice thing to, to be sitting here. First of all, someone actually saw the band play. And those sessions were, were hugely important to us as young players. This is, I would say, is the Fillmore. Grateful Dead? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that, that's me on acid, I think. <laughs> you, you all got dosed, right? I gave right? up playing drums. <laughs> I took to dancing. And, <laughs> okay. and just recently, I, I did a, a benefit with uh, Phil, the, the guitar player in, 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 in Grateful Dead. And he remembered that night. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. He never saw the picture or nothing. And he, he was just reminiscing. He said, because we played several times with the Grateful Dead. And in truth, it's no secret that they, they were stoned all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the worst damage we'd ever done was a pint of beer and, you know, you know a puff on an occasional joint. But they, they'd heard about Peter, for sure. And... They met us at, two of them met us at the airport. I still don't know. It's like these photographers that turn up at the airport. You go, how do you know we even arrived? <laughs> you know, that happened today a few times, more than a few times. And there's some network. Then they had found out that we were, were coming through proper channels or whatever. And they were there at the, the airport. And we had never heard of the Grateful Dead. We didn't know who the hell they were. <laughs> and and we, we were... Nobody, believe me, in England, we, we uh, happily had a really successful beginning, and, but we, no one knew who the hell we were, so it wasn't about that. We just didn't know who they were. And then we realized that they, they, they owned Cal California. They owned <laughs> and Ashbury. And, and boy, did we go into the, to the den. Like, there's like little... English boys going like, and Owsley, their road manager, is world famous for, you know, for the good and the bad of it, which is a whole other story. But it was definitely uh, capturing these helpless young English chaps and showing us into a world that, and that was, that was back there was one of the, the stories of our jam, end, endless Grateful Dead jams that ended up with mostly me dancing all the time. But that's at the Albert Hall with a tour uh, we did when 
like I said, we were blessed with, with instant, really, uh, success at a, what for us was a very grand level. I mean, real, real success and, and a, a blues album being in the charts where really is supposed to be playing pop music and everyone thought this young band had invented something brand new and really it was us copying our masters. But that, and that would be one of our masters. And we were, you know, the, the cat's whiskers in England and Peter said, well, let's, we're going on a tour. And, and Peter, I remember he said, I, I will absolutely not have it. B.B. King's going to be headlining. And we opened up for B.B. King uh, and had him. The, the Stones have done a lot of great stuff uh, that happens to be similar. Mm -hmm. Had Solomon Burke on great shows and insisted that great people have been playing on some of those early TV shows. Yeah, Howlin' Wolf on Shindig. Yeah, Howl yeah, yeah. yeah, and no one knew who Howlin' Wolf was, and they go, no, 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 we're, we're, this is... And that was our, our version in, in many ways. And B.B. still remembers that tour. Sadly, he, he's not that long gone, but he, he's, he's passed on. And it's always very obscure. He, he loved Peter Green, loved Peter Green, and remembered Everything would always, whenever I'd see him, he would mention about the music. And then, strangely enough, Bibi was partial to enjoying a good meal. And, and, <laughs> and for when the first time, but he never stopped saying it. Through all the years, he would repeat this story. He said, I remember being in a hotel, going back to the hotel in like Leicester or wherever it was, or Nottingham. And he had it right. And I said, yeah, I remember that. And he said, I always remember eating those cucumber sandwiches <laughs> <laughs> and a pint of beer after the gig. But That's fantastic. He, he had huge reverence, uh, and you can imagine how much that meant. And in the early, early days, when I knew nothing really in any great detail, and I mean way back before we, we were blessed with knowing or, or meeting or even playing, and we got to play many of the nights we we jammed during that tour uh, around Europe, uh, again, which gets forgotten, even by us bunch, you know. And B.B. Uh, King w was such a, uh, he always remembered Peter's touch. Wow. Peter's touch, and he would talk about it with, with reverence to a lot of great players, uh, English players that came out that He's such the guy. And then there was the whole side of B.B. King, which many of you must know about, uh, is that he was, when they talk about him being a gentleman, he was truly a gentleman and, and always had good graces and, and would never go to the side. He was just so happy that these, a lot of these funny little English guys had, in a way, brought back a... A, a form of music that, in some great respects, uh, and somewhat unbelievably, had been passed by, by the very country that it grew up in. That's exactly the right. The United States. And, and we, the Stones, for instance, and, and many of these funny English bands, it is true that the irony brought, you know, brought it back. And B.B. always would mention that in, in a, because uh, sometimes, and understandably, there, there was some bitterness about who's doing what and, and how some of these players uh, ended up feeling about an art form that was maybe not acknowledged, quite frankly, in their own country. And uh, that was uh, always a, a reminder of that. He spoke to it always. I saw very recent interviews, and he, he always said, you know what? How, how great was that, that it helped people in my world survive? And, and he, was, he really was B.B. King, uh, a master and, and a, a fun guy. And it was a privilege to play with him. That, I'm not sure. <laughs> Peter, Danny on the right, and that would be... It might... Oh, I wish I had some of the titles up. 
That's uh, Peter on six string bass. And well, this uh, is intriguing. <clears throat> that no, I think Peter is. Yeah, this is where Peter is beginning to make his transition out of the band. Yes? Yeah. Um, I mean, I was struck in the book when you mentioned, you know, when he would just begin showing up in what you describe as his Jesus clothes. And um, uh, the, the sense of, of, you know, at first, you know, look, it was a kind of time where people might do something like that. And, you know, in the way that in, in any band that stays together for any length of time, you know, people are given a certain amount of space to do whatever they like as long as they're there to do their show. Right. But, um, you know, he eventually, uh, you know, both, uh, both he and Jeremy, uh, you know, and separately, but dramatically, you know, left the band. And I mean, that, that had to just be completely devastating. Well, it was, and, and it's not spoken to it in, in any great detail, because this is, for me, is about the, the, the music and, and what we did. But that is, is, is absolutely the case. It was very, very dramatic, and, and, uh, and a lot of it ended up being confusing and, and something that, that still is what if. And, and for me, uh, and certainly speaking, if I might, for John a little bit, John McVie, is that you, part of you goes, I, I wished I'd known what to do that might have, might have, you, you question that, and, and it's very debatable, really, whether some of that journey would have taken place or not. But um, it, it did start to get, uh, but Peter was reaching out. Uh, if you listen to many of his songs, like Man of the World, it is uh, a, a very poignant song. And, and if you know, again, which is not, what this is all about, but I will, I'm happy to, to touch on it, was that he was crying out uh, and drowning, and we didn't know how to throw a rope or even that a rope needed throwing out, which is, um, always befuddles me as a person. Well, so much was going on at that time. It was, I think, very difficult really even to identify it. And you know, these things, if things were going to be any different, there is, has been plenty of time for them to have become different. But I know. for the most part, they've you know they've kind of stayed the same. There was a, um, I mean, Peter wrote a couple of pages in the book, which was um, quite moving. I thought, yeah. you know, his his statement and Jeremy's as well. No, it, 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 the whole thing is. I mean, the title is is one of it really. It, when you hear it, it the, the song "Love That Burns," it, it is, it floors me every time. And, and not only the timbre of his voice and what he happens to be singing about is so, it's so him, and and his guitar playing is beyond delicate and beautiful. But it, it became that, and and just you know, part of when I did the interview, and I don't think I mentioned it. It, it is so about what you've just come round a little bit of a full circle about Peter, is when I did that interview, when I say interview, conversation, and I, I said, I'm running a tape, and we spoke for about three hours, and I said, I just want, and we put some of the conversation in, in, into this lovely book. But one of the things that, that totally floored me, I thought, well, I had a few questions that I thought, oh, I'm going to actually ask him, you know. And one of them was, I, I, I wanted to know, why did you ask me to, to play next to you in the band, meaning pick me? He could have, he had a couple of other people that I found out that one of them was an old friend of his, Dave Bidwell, who actually ended up playing with Chicken Shack uh, with Christine. And I th maybe probably thought, well, I thought you were, a pretty good drummer, you know, like <laughs> <laughs> something that yeah, you know, sure, I, right, of course. maybe I, I, yeah. and I wasn't fishing for that. No, but and he instantly just went. Phew. He said, I said, why was that? He said, because you were sad. And I took a breath. And I'm going like, Where, where's this going? And he said, don't you remember? And I and he said, you'd just broken up with Jenny. 
who I later married, mother of, of two of my eldest daughters. And I went, he said, yeah, you needed something to do. And you, you, were, you, were, you were so unhappy that you needed that. That's extraordinary. And, and if you stop to think about it, that has so much value as, as a friend. It, f it, it floored me. Uh, my nephew, who helped me put the book together, who's here tonight, Kels, Kels Jess, uh, he phoned and said, how did it go? Because we're working on the book over the last couple of years. And I, you know, I, I will confess, I, I, I couldn't actually talk. I, I actually just burst into tears. I said, I'm so moved by, by I had, that is, that's Peter Green. It's like that. And he was very, very generous and, and loving and caring, whatever which way you want to describe it. So that's, after that interview, that's what happened. Amazing. Yeah, it is, it is pretty extraordinary. Well, I wonder if you have anything to say about these characters. And then he added, like, you're a useless drummer. <laughs> 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 Look at that, yeah. John and Chris, who would have known? Really? Yeah. And they're still dear, dear, dear friends. You know, that's Kiln House. That's the Kiln House period, which is after Peter left. That's me and Jenny at Kiln House. I've still got that car. <laughs> <laughs> that's in Hawaii. <laughs> Don't have the girl. I have the car now. Lettuce, lettuce leaf. <laughs> yes. It was um, blue then, but now it's green. I wonder if you have a Beatles story from your days uh, around that time when obviously, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, Jenny's sister was involved with George and oh. yeah, and I just wonder, was there a you know, particular moment that you, you know, just to kind of evoke, you know, the well, the, the band times, of that yeah, time which is, yeah. is, is sort of the backdrop to this period, which is, you know, Certainly, there are no pictures of the Beatles in there, but, but uh, just being I, by default, or whatever it's called, uh, George was my brother-in-law for many, many years, and Patty and George were married, and uh, Jenny, uh, I think we, we got married at Kiln House. Oops. Uh, there's Bob. But, uh, and, George and Patty came to the wedding and so forth. But, but one of the things I was reminded of in terms of trying to describe what was going on, and in the early days, uh, when even before Fleetwood Mac was formed, you know, we were around this thing called the Beatles, you know. <laughs> and I remember going to Abbey Road and actually being in the studio by just happened to be happening. And I forget, I think it was Paul, that is Maxwell's silver hammer, comes down across his yeah. head. <laughs> and he's actually hitting a real anvil, which is how they put the shoes on the horse, you know, and beat the, the hell out of the, the horseshoe. And there he is, whacking away at this thing, uh, which is on the record. And it's just like moments yeah. like that, that I, are, are relevant mo mostly when you look back because uh, we, we came from a different world. And what, one of the most lovely things that ever happened to this original band, Fleetwood Mac, we were coming back and Peter had written a song called Albatross, which is an instrumental, a very floaty, haunting instrumental. And they had obviously heard it. And we were coming back from a gig, and it was actually a godforsaken hour in the morning coming into, into London. I think we fell asleep at the side of the road and then decided to finish off the journey. As we're coming into London, early in the morning, John, whether it was a recording or not, I don't know, but they were on the radio uh, introducing tracks off one of their albums. And, and the, the, I think it was Sun King. Oh, yeah. At, Abbey Road, yeah. Abbey Road. Yeah. And, and John Lennon says, and we just had, we had the radio on. 
Um, and he said, yeah, this is where we're doing our Fleetwood Mac thing. <laughs> <laughs> and huh. that's a, for, for a little, you know, in our sure. world, we, we, were, we were doing OK, but we certainly weren't anywhere in it. But to hear that was going like, wow, bloody hell. <laughs> And, and I, I found out much later in time that when John Lennon put the, what was the band called? The Elephant, the White Elephant? Oh, with Elephant's Memory? Elephant's yeah. Memory. Yeah. Uh, uh, that I believe Eric ended up playing up in Canada or something, yeah, yeah. I think. Uh, Peter apparently was his first choice. And I don't know why Peter didn't do it. He should have, or, or what happened. But uh, you, he had a, a definitely a... a a, a high regard for Peter, as, as most and all guitar players from any style. Peter had an incredible, uh, and if you know Peter even back then, he was really very humble and then increasingly became so much so that, you know, when he picks this book up, he'll probably go, yeah, it's good, but he, and I, he, he won't be going, he doesn't know what he yeah, did. Flip, 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 where am I? Yeah, yeah or just like, yeah, <laughs> the way everyone else does. But I do. Yeah, <laughs> I certainly do. <laughs> this Bob well, Welch. This was, a, this was a dramatic transition. Yeah. Uh, sadly not with us anymore, but Bob uh, and that period with Bear Trees, Future Games, Mystery to Me, they're about four or five. Exactly. Uh, I mean, uh, Here is a Hard to Find was his last album. Then he went on to a very successful solo career uh, for quite some time and totally different. This is a real example of lesson learned coming full circle in mine and, and ostensibly John's world, where Bob was a very, very different style, style of guitar playing and songwriting and from where he came from. He came from sort of an R&B, jazz type of background and wrote all these very esoteric, floaty songs like Hypnotized and Bermuda Triangle. Just by the titles themselves, they demonstrate he, he was way out there in his thinking uh, and really was very knowledgeable about, if he wanted to talk about flying saucers, you would talk to <laughs> and, and he wrote, of course, uh, Sentimental Lady, and which later on we, we re-released when he was a solo artist. He had a big hit with it, and Stevie and Lindsay and Chris sang on it with him. And a great guy, absolutely fantastic guy, and, and a huge, huge uh, kudos, hats off to that period that very much gets... Uh, even more forgotten about than yeah, because the there's a section. kind of purist, um, you know, uh, interest in those early days. That everything that's documented here, you know, still if you go online, right. you know, like 40 years later, people are like, you know, I don't ever know why they gave up the blues. You know, they sure they've had some success, but you know, they were when they, when they were doing, in, you know, blah blah blah. You know, like there are people who are just still holding on to that. And, you know, and then obviously, you know, all of the tremendous, uh, you know, kind of impact and success and the phenomenal records and that, you know, you know, the kind of current, you know, sort oh, you of mean classic that, lineup. That? Yeah. <laughs> you know, that has its own standing. But there's that interim period, you know, that, you know, just gets overlooked. But like, God, you know, you did a lot of work and a lot of good work. And, yeah. um, you know, and it's, it's nicely, nicely documented here. No, it is, and and without that period, that's from the, that's Bob Weston, great guitar player, came into Fleetwood Mac from uh, Long John Baldry, who uh, was basically like a creative godfather to Rod Stewart, uh, and a great advocate, vocalist, blues singer, Long John Baldry, and Bob played with Baldry uh, on one of our early tours, uh, and then jumped boat. And he was on Mystery to Me. And that's at, at a house we all lived in called Benny Folds, which was uh, an extension of, that's the, the last shot. Uh, that's the restaurant, which is still there, El Carmen. Full circle, not that long ago, we decided to uh, 
to go back to where, which is not at all featured in here apart from, that's where I introduced, in that restaurant, introduced John and Christine to uh, Lindsay Buckingham and Stevie Nicks. And without an audition, they'd heard the, uh, the Buckingham Nicks album and almost unbelievably, or maybe on the face of it, even almost stupid, but we loved the music so much that we didn't play a note. Not, they might have been like Milli Vanilli or something. <laughs> <laughs> what if they actually, it wasn't them, no. <laughs> but it, it, it was, and, and that's where we had dinner. And the, on, the only slight hint of, of anything, Christine, who's a real band member, like she's a player, and she said to me and John that could be, they'd fallen in love with the music that I'd heard, and we made the decision that nothing was going to stop it. But Chris did say, she said, let's just say, let, let's meet, because there's nothing worse than two women that don't get along. <laughs> <laughs> and in laws and all these stories that maybe some of you can even, you know in a humorous way, think of. And they got on like a house on fire because they're, they're, they're so different. And, and Chris is, is so much of a band player that she was already welcoming the, and she'd heard the harmonies uh, in th these two magical voices that came into a whole another story that, that's uh, not in this book for sure. But yeah. that, that's where it but started. But this is only volume one. Well, yeah. we hope so yeah. one day. <laughs> We uh, I just want to run just a couple of questions quickly um, uh, from the audience. There's um, any ideas why classic American blues hit home so deeply with British musicians uh, in the late 50s and early 60s? You know, what was it, do you think, that? Yeah, I, oof. I, I, think it, I think it might have something to do with, you know, coming out of the god awful war and a lot of energy that just generally said no more of that, you know, in a subconscious type of way, and, and, and people wanting to express feelings, uh, and music is, is, is doubtless almost one of the most, if not the most, quietly powerful ways of, that transcends everything. Uh, art, for sure, when you look at it, does, does the same thing. Writing very often can be, but is sometimes specific to certain cultures, and music tends to blow some of those walls down. And I think that was part of why we, we were all nuts for everything. When you, when you hear interviews about the Beatles and what they were hearing, and, and music that came through American GIs that was played in Europe, because you know, half of Europe was and still is with massive military bases all over the place and, and music uh, on a, a channel called Radio Luxembourg was, was you were you heard blues and rock early rock and roll stuff because the guys the guys in the forces w would enjoy that and and some of that came from there and some of it came on the merchant ships uh, during the war and after the war when there's huge amounts of of American uh, music, and some of it was for sure R&B and, and blues slipped in. And, and then it became just something that the, the culture was ripe for the picking. And I'm, I'm never quite sure what it was, but I've heard interviews, they all seem to, you know, uh, some of the players that came from those days in my world, you know, Eric and Jimmy Page and guitar players and other, other artists. And they all seemed to sort of say, we were sort of ready for something that, that was, was going to be ours and not saccharine and not sweet. And I think blues, just the very nature of the word blues, which to me, anything, any genre of music can be blue. And it's not, you don't have to be, you know, from the, the Delta, playing Delta blues to be playing blues. Uh, but it was, 
it was the flagship, and, and it was a way of saying something that you needed to say, and sometimes, God knows, back in the day, that those folks weren't allowed freely to express themselves, and they, they went to church, and I mean that with music. Uh, and that appealed to a uh, sensibility of a lot of young folk, certainly in this strange little country, England, latched onto that, and it just became uh, something that they really didn't let go of in, in my world. It's not, and again, there was all sorts of music that came out of England, we know that, but that's why I think it, it, it seemed to have happened, and, and I, certainly why it, it appealed to, to Peter, as I mentioned earlier on in, in our lovely talk, was he, he was ripe for the picking, that that music uh, was an expression of being free and yet being held back by certain feelings that he, he couldn't get out unless he found a vehicle to shout it through. And, and blues, the fundamentals of blues music uh, was something that just triggered that, flicked that switch and set him free uh, for a while. And this um, it's kind of a maybe whimsical question, an alternative universe question here. Looking back, if you hadn't had this career, what would you have liked to be? I, I would have liked to have, well, I didn't want to be, but I think, you know, if I could have flicked a switch, I would have liked to have been an actor. Ah. That works. And I say that because one of my elder sisters was a very fine actress, and, and Susan, and I was blessed with being around that world. And remember, if I hadn't played drums, really what I'm confessing to is God knows what I would have done. So I, I can't add up, I can't read very well. <laughs> and I'm not kidding. And, and it so appealed to me because I'm seeing her working in the early days as, as a student, and then I thought, well, at least I could sweep the floor or something backstage. Or I, I'm so lucky that I, I became, you know, this. Uh, and I, I, it always, it did appeal to me what I saw Susan doing, uh, but I, I don't think I would have had the discipline. To, to have done it, so I, I really lucked out that I found something to, because I, I needed to express myself too, and, and, and Peter, in his magical way, uh, taught me that you're doing that. You know, first of all, you don't know what you're doing, which is actually good, <laughs> because you're in the moment, and you're, gonna, you're, you're vulnerable, and you're gonna have to grab hold of what's going on, and go with it, and not have any too many preconceived things. It, it was for him to have, and I'm not kidding, that's sort of what he told me, that, that it's okay what you're doing. You don't need to be that clever, like doing all this stuff. I've learned to do some of that along the way, but. I mean, uh, your sense of time, I think, was always the thing that I responded to, certainly in that, I mean, well, throughout, but like in that early stuff where, you know, you've got these guys who were, leaping off, like somebody's got to hold down the fort and just be well, right there. And I think, you know, that, and, you know, obviously John too, but right, you know, that's, yeah. that seems to me to be your gift. I mean, it's that solidity, um, you know, and the, the regularity, it's just like, go where you want to go, we're going to be right here, you know? Yeah, and, and, and it, it works because I actually couldn't go anywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> well, you make a virtue out of these uh, things. Uh, well, Mick, we're very lucky. We're very lucky that you lucked out and, uh, and decided to be a drummer in a band. And uh, this was such a great pleasure. And those of you, uh, you know, would like to uh, join Mick for the meet and greet for the book and you know, get your, you know, sign up for your signed copy, you know, uh, please stick around. But uh, let's all just show some appreciation for uh, Mick Whitney.